Hi, good evening to everybody. Sai Milo Govan, Axi.com online course and for teaching zoology. We have the fluid system in the body responsible for the transport of nutrients, waste products, the various types of gases, etc. And we have seen the various components of the blood, also the fluid tissue. The next part of that system, that is the fluid system, the defense mechanism, what we have, the coagulation of blood or clotting of blood or hemostasis. So one of the defense mechanisms in the body against the loss of blood is coagulation mechanism or the clotting of blood. So it is nothing but the defense mechanism to prevent the excess loss of blood at the time of injury or trauma. So normally at the site of injury or trauma what will happen? You see normally the blood is in a fluid state. The fluidity of the blood inside the blood vessel is maintained because of certain factors. For example, when the blood vessels are intact, there is no loss of blood. And also in the circulating medium, we have certain anticoagulants which prevent the clotting of blood and maintaining the fluidity of the blood. So, the fluidity of the blood is maintained because of these two main factors. One, the intact blood vessels. Number two, the anticoagulant. But sometimes what will happen, there is an injury happens to the blood vessel. So at the site of injury, what will happen, the blood loses its liquid property, the blood is bleeding out from the blood vessel and normally it loses its liquid property at the site of injury within 5 to 8 minutes. So this is nothing but the clotting time, the normal clotting time that is nothing but the converting the liquid blood into semi-solid jelly-like material to block the opening to prevent the loss of blood. And that is about 5 to 8 minutes. That is about the normal clotting time. So within this time what will happen at the site of injury, the liquid blood loses its fluid nature and becomes a semi-solid jelly to block the passage or the bleeding of blood from the blood vessels. This phenomenon is normally called as a blood coagulation process, blood clotting process or also technically called hemostasis. The process of conversion of liquid blood into a semi-solid gel which blocks the opening where you have the injury occurs so that there is no loss of blood. This is what will happen as a defense mechanism in all the living organisms but even the human being. But this blood clotting is not a simple process. It is a complicated process which involves a number of chemical reactions. Biochemical reactions are taking place at times of injury in the blood to block the blood vessel, the opening. And it involves a number of biochemical reactions. And for doing such chemical reactions, we need nearly about more than 13 factors. There are major factors, 13, and also we have some minor factors altogether. We have nearly 36 factors have been formed, playing a major role in the process of clotting. So, I mentioned this actually, there are 13 factors. These factors are named from 1 to 13 Roman letters. Also they have specific names. For example, so we have factor number 1, just actually fibrinogen, then prothrombin, factor number 2, thromboplastin, factor number 3, calcium ions, factor number 4, labile factor, factor number 5, then accelerate, factor number 6, factor number 7, for example, proconvertin. And eighth factor and hemophiliac factor, Christmas factor, then Stewart factor, then we have actually Hadjuman factor, and so on. We have nearly 13 factors, they are named as 1 to 30. And these factors are playing a major role in the clotting of blood. So, out of these four, 13 factors, the first four factors are considered as most important factors. They are considered as the most important factors out of the 13 major factors. Now, what are the four factors which are considered as the important factors in doing the process of clotting. So number one, see, fibrinogen, this is factor number one, fibrinogen. It is nothing but a fibrous protein, a plasma protein normally synthesized in the liver but circulating in the blood, a kind of fibrous protein circulating in the blood but the place of formation and production is nothing but actually the liver. The second one, prothrombin. This is considered as a factor number two. It is a glycoprotein, a conjugated protein once again. So most of the factors are proteins only, except in certain elements. 
So fibrinogen, a plasma protein, a fibrous protein produced in the liver. And likewise, also the second important factor, prothrombin, a factor number two, it is a conjugated protein, a glycoprotein. It is also synthesized in the liver with the help of vitamin K. So for the synthesis of prothrombin, because the prothrombin later converted from thrombin, which is acting as an enzyme for doing some activities during the process of clotting, an important factor. But for the synthesis of this glycoprotein prothrombin, we need value vitamin K. That is why we have the nickname for this vitamin K also. As it prevents the bleeding process and promoting the clotting process, it is called anti-hemorrhagic vitamin. The nickname for this one vitamin K, essential for clotting process, preventing the bleeding, otherwise called hemorrhage process. So that is why it's called anti-hemorrhagic vitamin, preventing actually the hemorrhage. So for the formation of prothrombin, we need badly vitamin K. Now fact number 3, thromboplasm. It is a kind of lipoprotein, considered as fact number 3. One, just we have fibrinogen, the second one prothrombin, then the fact number 3, that is thromboplastin, a kind of lipoprotein. It is not synthesized in the liver, but it is formed in the tissues as well as in the platelets. It is abundant. The lipoprotein is abundant in the platelets and also the tissue cells. So it is not being synthesized by the liver except in the previous two. And the last one, the most important factor also, we need badly the calcium ions. In the absence of calcium ions, there is no process of clot. So this calcium ion is acting as main factor, a cofactor for activating what is called just actually the prothrombin one thing, just one enzyme that is being formed for converting one substance into another during the process of clot. So calcium ions also acting as a cofactor. Now how does normally the process of clotting initiated? So at the site of injury, normally we have bleeding process. So that injury or trauma stimulate mainly the platelets. So the first structure which is being stimulated or actually activated nothing but the platelets at the site of injury. So and as a result what will happen when the platelets being damaged, these platelets release certain factors. And these factors activate the mechanism of coagulation. So, once the platelets are initiated, there are some factors along with the tissue factors. And these factors normally activate or initiate the mechanism of coagulation. So, anyway, the platelets release some factors. And these factors along with the tissue factors, TF, simply called as TF, released by the damaged tissues. Both together taking part in initiating the mechanism of coagulation. Now let's see how this actually the mechanism of coagulation occur. So all is that we have a number of steps taking place during the process of clotting. But I am taking only a few steps only all the three major steps which are responsible for converting the fluid or liquid blood into a semi-solid jelly. Now step number one, formation of thrombokinase or prothrombinase. It is also called prothrombinase. This one is also called prothrombinase. Now at the site of injury what will happen the tissue is being damaged. So the first one tissue damage. And also at that place we have the damaged platelets. So at the site of injury because of the impact of force the cells are damaged as well as the platelets. So they produce one factor what is called TF or tissue factor. This tissue factor is also called thromboplastin a lipoprotein structure. That is the first step formation of thromboplast. Once thromboplastin is formed, in the presence of certain other factors circulating in the blood, I mentioned here fiber, what is called labile fat, 7 pro-converting fat and 10 a steward fat. So we have labile fat, pro-converting fat and steward fat. But I am simply representing only 5, 7, 10. So in the presence of these factors, what will happen? The tissue factor forms a complex. Some reactions are taking place between these factors with what is called the tissue factor thromboplastin. As a result, we have received a substance what is called thrombokinase or prothrombinase. The first step formation of thromboplastin and lipoprotein structure. In the presence of the other factors, the blood clotting factors, for example, 5, 7, 10, 
Now this tissue factor forms a complex and that complex is called thrombokinase or prothrombinase. So this prothrombinase actually is a direct immediate effect normally and because once actually all reactions are taking place one after another. So no reaction is independent, they are all dependent on each other. Once the first step has been completed, that first step end product stimulates the second stage of coagulation. So, what I mentioned is thrombokinase, it is a direct immediate agent because it is the first agent immediately responsible for converting the substance, the next stage, what is called the prothrombin into thrombin. That is why we can see this fact is very important. So, if there is no formation of what is called thrombokinase or prothrombinase, there is no conversion of this prothrombin to thrombin, that is the next stage or the next step. Now, we will go to the next step. So, the next step is nothing but the conversion of uh, actually prothrombin to thrombin. And before that, what would happen during the first step? In a sequence of order. I mentioned already we have the damaged platelets and tissues. From these damaged platelets and tissues, we have received what is called the tissue factor or thromboplasty. So, we have normally both extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors normally form inside the platelets. The extrinsic factors normally form outside the platelets, I made a mistake. And intrinsic factors are formed within the cells, namely the tissues and also there is the platelets. So, certain factors, for example, we can say the extrinsic factor, the 5, 7, 10. These are all extrinsic factors present circulating in the blood. An intrinsic factor, nothing but the thromboplastin or tissue factor. So, in the presence of extrinsic factors 5, 7, 10, an intrinsic factor normally is thromboplastin to form a complex and that is called prothrombinase or thrombokinase. So, that is what is happening during the first stage. Now, during the second step, formation of thrombin. So, this thrombin is actually acting as enzyme, a protein-like enzyme. It is what is called a kind of protein, a glycoprotein. It is formed in the form of a precursor in the liver as prothrombin with the help of vitamin K. So, this thrombin is acting as an enzyme and which has a powerful effect on coagulation. Which has a powerful effect on coagulation. So, actually, it is acting as a proteolytic enzyme, just normally, which has a powerful effect on coagulation. Okay, right. So, powerful effect on coagulation. So, it does not exit as such in the circulating blood, what I mentioned here. The meaning for that one, they are formed in a precursor form in the liver with the help of vitamin E and released into the blood, circulating the blood only as prothrombin, a kind of glycoprotein. And normally this thrombin is formed when this precursor, what is called the product, what is formed in the liver, prothrombin and that one reacts with the thrombokinase, what we have received in the first step. So the thrombokinase or prothrombinase which is formed in the first step reacts with this prothrombin in the presence of cofactor what is called actually the calcium ions. Calcium ions. So in the presence of calcium ions. So, calcium ions acting as a cofactor. The prothrombin is normally released from the liver, circulating in the blood. At times of need only, the prothrombin gets converted into thrombin, a proteolytic enzyme, with the help of cofactor, the calcium ions. And in the presence of prothrombin is the first product which is formed during the first step. So, this is what is happening during the second stage formation of thromboplastin into prothrombinase, the first step. And the second step, we have the formation of thrombin from prothrombin. With the help of the prothrombinase or thrombokinase, the product formed at the end of the first stage, along with the cofactor calcium ions. So, without calcium ions, normally we cannot have the ability of converting the liquid blood into jelly-like substance. So, normally even in the case of, for example, in blood bank, they are using some anticoagulants to prevent the clotting process, to maintain the blood in a fluid state. And those anticoagulants in the form of chemicals, the artificial ones, they are normally binding the calcium ions. So once the calcium ions are bound, they cannot have the ability to act as a cofactor in helping the prothrombinase. That is a mechanism what we are adapting in blood bags. 
To keep the blood in fluid state, it comes later once again. I will tell you about this one. Anticoagulants, both chemical or artificial, as well as natural anticoagulants, what we have in our body as well as in the laboratory. So, anyway, the calcium helps that is a cofactor in bring about the coagulation process, without which there is no coagulation process. Now, what is the step number three? Now we have another protein, the fact number three, what I mentioned, fibrinogen, a soluble protein circulating in the blood, a fibrous protein. Once found in the liver, it is released into the circulating blood, it is circulating in the blood. Now this fibrinogen is being broken or hydrolyzed by the enzyme thromine. The thromine is acting as a proteolytic enzyme and converting this soluble fibrinogen into a thread-like fibrin a mesh or a thread, a fine thread which is normally formed from the soluble fibrinogen so this fibrin is insoluble so fibrinogen which is a soluble protein circulating in blood is converted into insoluble fibrin by the action of what is called the enzyme thrombin which is acting as a proteolytic enzyme Though I am telling everything in a simple manner, but the chemical reactions are taking place in a complicated way. Even in this step, for example, the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin not takes place in a simple manner, in a simple or in a simple step. For example, here I mentioned what are the different stages of conversion of this fibrinogen to fibrin. So there are th different stages that occur during the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. For example, to begin with, the fibrinogen, a polymer, is broken into many monomers. That process is called proteolysis. That process is called proteolysis. That process is called proteolysis. So there is nothing but the breakdown of uh, that fibrinogen protein into just fibrin monomers. Once the fibrin monomers are formed, they are all actually gathered together. They undergo polymerization to form a long chain of these monomers, the fibrin monomers, to form a long chain of thread. So a thread-like structure is formed because of the polymerization, because of the addition of what is called the fibrin monomers. Then we have the clot. That is nothing but that the site of injury. We have these fibrin monomers later form the fibrin polymers, get settled down at the opening along with platelets to form a clot. So a clot is actually formed from you know that one, a fine network of what is called the fibrin filaments. And while it is being laid down as a meshwork or a network, it entraps the blood cells. So the clot is formed of fibrin plus the various types of blood cells which are being trapped by this fibrin network. That is actually the clot. That one normally blocks the opening not allowing the blood to leak out. That is why we can also maintain the blood as such the volume and also the BP not being reduced because of the blockage of what is called opening that will prevent the leakage of the blood. So that is what is happening during the third stage, the fibrinogen that is a protein being converted into fibrin after passing through these stages, proteolysis, nothing but the breakdown of this fibrinogen into fibrin monomers. Then the fibrin monomers undergo polymerization to form a long chain, to form a thread-like structure and ultimately we have the clot. The clotting actually blocking of the opening with the help of what is called fibrin which is being laid down as a meshwork or a network which entrap the blood cells, the blood vessels are in blood cells like WBCs, RBCs and also the platelets etc which are being entrapped. So as to form a curtain, a curtain that blocks the opening so there is no more leakage as we have developed the defense. Now the clot is also called as a coagula. The another name for clot coagula. So what are the components of the clot I mentioned actually? So it is formed mainly of a network of what is called the fine threads of fibre in which we have the dead and damaged formed elements of blood. The formed elements include, you know, the, the WBCs, RBCs, platelets, all being trapped. So that we can have a complete curtain at the point of opening. So I mentioned only calcium ions plays an important role in clotting without which there is no clotting process. See, this is the magnified, actually the clot. See that one, the whole structure is a clot. And the green or the bluish green structures represent the fibrin. 
and once the fibrin is laid down at the opening and actually the blood is try to move away from that one try to pass through that one at that time what happen this fibrin network in the form of what is called a sieve plate just to entrap the WBCs the rose colored cells and also we have just the RBCs so all being entrapped so that a complete coagulum, a curtain or a plate like structure is formed and that is the clot that blocks the leakage of blood that by maintaining the normal volume of blood and beat. Now, actually I mentioned already we have to keep the blood in a fluid state. How is the fluidity of the blood maintained inside the body? And for that there are certain substances formed inside the body which prevent the formation of clotting or which prevent the formation of clot or the coagulation process is being prevented because of the presence of such substances that are called anticoagulants. These anticoagulants may be a natural anticoagulant or artificial one. So natural anticoagulants are formed inside the body. The name, chemical nature is different in different organisms and the artificial ones what we are using mostly the inorganic act with the salt and they are all used in the laboratory to prevent the clotting while the blood being stored in blood bank. So, these are all natural artificial chemical substances used normally to prevent the normal coagulation of blood. Then inside your body, we have certain natural anticoagulant. So, number one, heparin we have. We have only one, that is what is called heparin. This heparin is nothing but a heteropolysaccharide. Actually, nitrogen containing, just a sulfur containing, a polysaccharide, N glucosamide, N sulfur glucosamide. So, this is heparin, a heteropolysaccharide, just like for example, chitin. So, I mentioned already about this chitin under the biomolecules. This is another biomolecule that is what is called a heteropolysaccharide, N glucosamide. So, heparin is an anticoagulant circulating in our blood and which prevents the coagulation of blood by preventing the formation of thrombin from prothrombin and that is its main function. So it is a polysaccharide. But in the case of leech, you know that leech saliva contains a substance what is called hirudin. We have seen already that is why the name of our leech is called hirudinia. The name of the leech is called hirudinia. So hirudin actually a kind of protein in saliva found in leeches. So actually in leeches, that saliva contains hirudin, a protein, but this one, what we have in the circulating blood is a heteropolysaccharide. Then in the case of mosquitoes, so normally we have these anticoagulants found in the case of ectoparasites or the sanguivorous animals which feed on the blood. So hemolysin is a kind of what is called a natural anticoagulant found in the saliva of mosquitoes for continuous flow of blood while sucking the blood, they are adding this anticoagulant to prevent the coagulation of blood. So there is a continuous flow of blood while they are sucking the blood. Now in the case of a cyclostome, jawless vertebrae, in petromyzone, the name of the animal, so normally called as lambrays, it contains actually it is a, a, having a sucker, it is actually an ectoparasite attached to the lower the fishes, the lambi artery, that is another anticoagulant released by petromyzone, a uh, cyclostome, a uh, jawless vertebrae, and that is called lambiotin. So these are all some of the natural anticoagulants found in the living body. Now we also have artificial ones or synthetic ones. They are called artificial anticoagulants. So in the laboratory blood bank, we are adding sodium citrate and sodium oxalate. So once we are adding a pinch of sodium citrate or sodium oxalate to the blood to be stored in blood bank to maintain its fluid nature, what will happen the sodium citrate binds with sodium citrate or sodium oxalate binds with calcium ions, binds with the calcium ions. So once calcium ions are bound, there is no process of what is called coagulation process. So normally these are all happening. The calcium ions, without calcium ions, you know that one we have there is no coagulation continuous bleeding occurs. Even when you have the deficiency of calcium, there is no coagulation continuous bleeding or hemorrhage occurs, just like the deficiency of vitamin K. Now, another one, dipumaro, this is another one uh, that is artificial anticoagulant to be added. In what way it is working normally, it 
prevents the formation of thrombin from proton. When this chemical is added to the blood, it keeps the blood in fluid state by preventing the formation of thrombin from prothrombin. So, these are all actually the artificial anticoagulants, but in the blood bank we are using either sodium citrate or sodium oxalate. That function is binding the calcium, preventing the coagulation process. Now we are using some drugs to avoid the coagulation or to just treat the heart disorders. Now one such one is clot buster. So it is not a thrombolytic in activity, a thrombolytic drug. How? Once clot is formed, the removal of clot is called thrombolysis. So this clot buster is a group of normally clot dissolving drugs. Clot dissolving drugs. That's why I mentioned thrombolytic in nature. Thrombolysis just acted the dissolving the clot. So in some cases, for example, if there is blockage by means of this clot, intra, what is called intravascular clot, a clot is formed inside the blood vessel. To remove this one, we are adding this one, just the clot buster into the blood circulation. That one dissolves the clot, the one which is circulating inside the blood vessels or the one which is attached to the wall of the blood vessel. So that is called the clot buster, a group of clot dissolving drugs. Thrombolytic in nature. Thrombolysis means normally dissolving the clot. Used in the treatment of heart attack. Sometimes you have blockage in the heart blood vessels and that clot being removed by just actually the clot buster drugs. Now beta block. So what do you mean by beta blocker? There is actually another drug used the treatment of heart disorders. Sometimes we have the blood pressure is higher. The rate of heartbeat is higher. In order to suppress the rate of heartbeat, thereby just reducing the BP, they are using what is called the beta block. Because it works by blocking what is called the impulses from the sympathetic nervous system. Because the heartbeat is accelerated by the release of chemicals or a transmitter from the sympathetic nervous system. Normally, it is, an, it is a part of autonomous nervous system. It accelerates the rate of heartbeat. Once the rate of heartbeat has been increased, you know that one, you have the heartbeat rate is increasing, ultimately the BP is also increasing because of actually the speed of muscle contraction of the heart. And by blocking actually the sympathetic nervous system to reach the part, the pacemaker inside the heart, we are going to study later. So once there is no stimulus to stimulate what is called the SA node inside the heart, we can just prevent or we can reduce the rate of heartbeat thereby reducing the peak. And such chemicals or the drugs used for preventing or blocking the sympathetic nervous system to reach what is called the node which is the place of origin of heartbeat, suppressing its activity. So the rate of heartbeat has been decreased, so also the BP. Now hemolysis, this is a common term used for the destruction of RBCs. If the RBCs is being destroyed, that phenomenon is called hemolysis. Then also another medicine actually uh, what is called a plant medicine, digitoxin and or and also called decoxin. So this digitoxin or decoxin is actually prepared from digitalis, a plant, an extract from the plant. The name of the plant digitalis. And that one normally increases the rate of heartbeat by increasing the heart muscle contraction. When there is what is called the heart failure, this is the opposite effect of beta block. So this digital is actually the plant which produces a decoxin or digitoxin. And that is being used to accelerate what is called the heart muscle contraction. When the heart muscle contraction has been increased, ultimately the rate of heartbeat is increasing. That is being done in the case of heart failure. Now, what are the different types of circulatory patterns in animals? Generally in all these animals we can classify the circulatory system into two types. One is called the open circulatory system and another one closed. So what do you mean by open circulatory system? Here there is a heart or maybe heart like structure and that heart like structure or the heart may pump the blood. The pumped blood is normally passing through some large blood vessels. And these large blood vessels empty, actually they, these large blood vessels empty the blood into certain open spaces or body cavities called simply the sinuses. So we have some poorly developed blood vessels and also not well developed the heart. The heart pumps the blood, 
the pumped out blood passes through the large blood vessels but there instead of circulating through the blood vessels the blood is emptied into a body cavity or a open space that open space is called sinus that type of circulatory system simply we can say there are no blood vessels there are no blood vessels so the circulatory system without blood vessels where the blood is not flowing through the blood vessels is called open circulatory system example arthropods and mollusks in the case of arthropods and mollusks we have open circulatory system now the next one the closed circulatory system here the blood is circulating through a system of tubes called the blood vessels it is not emptied into open spaces so in the previous one normally you see that when the organs are bathing in the blood but here it is not so here the blood is pumped by the heart and it is always circulating through a network of branched tubes what are called the blood vessels it is very common in the case of for example annelids and cordates so in the case of cockroach or in the case of pond snail and the one previous one belongs to arthropods the snails belongs to you know that one that is mollusk so in the case of arthropods and mollusks we have open type of circulatory system but in the case of all chordates and annelids we have closed type of circulatory system where the blood is circulating through the blood vessels now here is the picture that shows a simple diagrammatic representation here i represented one example the arthropod that is an insect the grasshopper now you see that one there is a heart the heart is pumping blood there are some poorly developed blood vessels so the blood is passing through the blood vessels reaching the open spaces these are all the open spaces normally in these animals the blood is mostly colorless such a colorless blood is called hemolymph hemolymph so in the case of arthropods the blood is called hemolymph it is normally colorless but in some cases there are exceptions we have actually blue colored blood that is different so hemolymph in sinuses and they are all surrounding the organs exchange of gas is taking place between the organs and the blood the materials are being exchanged between the blood and in which are actually the organs both in they are taking and giving out all these things happening here so the open circulatory system is see that is normally a pot which pumps the blood which enters into the space and from here once again some small and developed blood vessels it is returning to the heart once again it is being circulated not completely circulating through the blood vessels but if you are taking the earth bone so first animal which has developed a closed circulatory system in the case of annelids if you are taking it is the first animal which has developed closed circulatory system so there you have the heart the heart pumps the blood the blood is reaching various organs from the various organs the blood is collected once again by the blood vessels the blood vessel is carrying the blood to the heart once again the heart is pumping the blood in such a manner you see that when the blood is circulating through the blood vessels that is why it's called as closed type of circulatory system as seen in the case of annelids and also all chordates now what is the nature of circulatory system in different groups of animals only the case of vertebrates we are talking about because in the case of invertebrates we have mainly the open circulatory system except in the case of annelids now we will talk about fishes what is the nature of circulatory system in the case of fishes so in the case of fishes now the heart is two chambered having one atrium one ventricle two chambered heart and normally the heart is described as the venous heart this heart is described as the venous heart the reason for that one suppose we are taking it suppose we are taking your example as a human being we have the heart the heart receives two types of blood one is oxygenated blood another one deoxygenated blood but as per this animal is concerned that is the fish the fish receives only deoxygenated blood the heart receives only the deoxygenated blood and pumps only the deoxygenated blood there is no reception of oxygenated blood by this heart so that is why the heart is described as a venous heart so now the heart receives that what is called deoxygenated blood and pumps the blood towards the gills for oxygenation once the blood has been purified or oxygenated the oxygen blood never returns to the heart it is being carried directly to the various body parts and such a type of actually circulation we can say single circulation the meaning for the one 
the blood goes only once to the heart during actually the course of the passage of blood to the body parts so only once only once the blood goes so from the body the blood reaches the heart from the heart the blood is reaching the gills from the gills it is reaching the body only from the body only the blood is reaching the heart so the type of circulation where normally the blood goes only once through the heart during one cycle of the passage of what is called one cycle of passage through the body then it is called single circulation then what about the nature of uh, circulation in the case of ambivalence so now this is the illustration of what is called single circuit heart or we can say what is called the venous heart circulation or simply what is called single circulation now you see this is the heart the heart receives only the deoxygenated see which is being represented in blue color so the heart receives only deoxygenated so this is what is called the reception the blood is being received and it is being pumped the deoxygenated is pumped to the gills where purification occurs now we have the purified blood that is reaching the body parts we are also reaching the body parts so various parts of the body receive only this oxygenated blood and the heart receives only deoxygenated blood so from the body parts the deoxygenated blood is again carried to the heart you see that one actually to the body parts it is reaching from this one it is reaching the heart once again and from where just once again the blood is pumped to the gills for purification that is why it is called a simple circuit circulation is simply simple circulation the heart is called as a venous heart because it receives only the venous blood namely the deoxygen blood the another name for deoxygen blood is called the venous blood or you can say impure blood normally now here is a real picture showing how this actually the blood is circulating in the case of fishes now blood from various parts of the body is normally entering into a structure what is called sinus venosus a part of heart from the sinus venosus the blood is reaching a single atrium and from the single atrium the blood is reaching a single ventricle when the ventricle is pumping blood the first part of the blood vessel the aorta what is called the conus arteriosus is structured normally found in the case of uh, fishes and also in the case of uh, that is uh, amphibians a conus arteriosus nothing but a cone shaped in the initial part of the aorta which carries actually the impure blood to the gills so these are all the respiratory capillaries where we have the exchange of gases taking place now the purified blood is taken to the different parts of the body once again from different parts of the body the impure blood is collected reaching what is called sinus venosus atrium ventricle conus arteriosus again to the gills so here the blood reaches only once to the heart that to what is called the deoxygen blood reaches the heart not the oxygenated blood is being taken actually directly to the various organs from the gills now what about the nature of actually circulatory system in the case of amphibians and also in some reptiles it's not in all cases so amphibians and reptiles excluding the crocodiles excluding the crocodiles amphibians and reptiles excluding the crocodiles they have normally three chambered heart we have two atria and only one ventricle just actually they have two atria and only one ventricle so there is a chance of mixing up suppose this part receives what is called the impure blood and this part receives the pure blood now both are entering into a single ventricle so there is a chance of mixing of what is called the both oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and normally these animals they have three chambered heart two at and one ventricle so they can tolerate some mixing of the oxygen blood and the heart is normally pumping only the mixed blood not either actually oxygen blood or deoxygen blood it is a mixed blood which is being pumped by the heart to reach the different parts of the body so see amphibians like frogs and also salamanders etc reptiles saying the example of lizards Then the snakes and also actually the turtles, tortoises, etc. Excepting the crocodiles, they have to reach a bar. So they can tolerate normally some mixing of the oxygen layers in blood, and the ventricle pumps up only the mixed blood. So it is also called incomplete double circulation. I'll come to this word in a minute. Double circulation. 
the heart actually receives the blood twice. Now, in the case of crocodiles or reptiles, in the case of mammals and birds, particular, and there is what is called no mixing of oxygen blood. There is a separate oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Normally, they are being pumped by the heart. So, there is no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated. Such a heart is called atriovenous heart. The meaning for that one. There is no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So fishes have venous heart because they pump only deoxygenated blood. And in the case of first, the amphibians and reptiles groups of animals, excepting the crocodiles, they have only the ability of just pumping up only the mixed blood. But in the case of birds and mammals, including humans, there is no mixing of the two blood and only the blood being pumped, just oxygen blood to different parts of the body and the deoxygen blood is received by the heart through different blood vessels. So, the heart pumps only the oxygen blood to different parts of the body and pumps deoxygen blood to the lungs for purification. That is what is happening. Such a heart is called a true venous heart. So, and that is actually when the advance is taking place in the group of organisms during the course of evolution. Advancement also occurs in the evolution of what is called the different systems of the body. Such a system where you have the separation of mixed, mix, sorry, separation of what is called the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood allows high efficient supply of oxygen to different parts of the body. So, in course of evolution, there is increase in complexity of each and every system to compensate that increase in complexity of each and every system. So here also the circulatory system attains its maximum actually complexity and such a one normally is responsible for efficient supply of oxygen to different parts of the body. So in these organisms that is including the crocodiles we have two separate circulatory pathways. Two separate circulatory pathways. Hence these animals have what is called the double circulation. What is the meaning of double circulation? Normally the blood goes through the heart twice during each cycle of the heart. What we can say the cardiac cycle. So blood goes through the heart twice during each cardiac cycle. So that is why it is called double circulation. And also we have two separate circulations. One concerned with actually the heart and lungs. Another one concerned with the heart and the body parts. That is why it is called double circulation. We will see what do you mean by the double circulation. Now double circulation humans. So what is happening in the case of double circulation humans? Why is it called as a double circulation? Because we have two separate circulating systems. Now this is actually a picture showing a double circulation. Now the double circulation, there are two different types of double circulation. One is called pulmonary circulation where the lungs are involved. Another one is called systemic circulation where the different parts of the body are involved. So, heart and lungs together constitute the pulmonary circulation. Heart and other body parts together constitute systemic circulation. Now, what do you mean by pulmonary circulation? Now, after receiving the impure blood, that is normally it is being received by what is called this part, the right atrium receives impure blood. And from where it is being pumped into the right ventricle. So we have the right ventricle. This is right atrium, this is right ventricle. So the pulmonary circulation normally starts from the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the deep house blood is pumped into what is called the pulmonary artery. Now this one is a pulmonary artery, which carries this blood to the lungs for purification. As we have two lungs, the blood being carried towards each one for purification. So in the lungs what is happening, the blood has been oxygenated or otherwise called purified. Now the oxygen blood is carried away from the lungs towards the heart by pulmonary veins. So two from each lungs. So the pulmonary veins normally open into the left atrium. So a pulmonary circulation starts from the right ventricle passing through the pulmonary artery, reaching the lungs. After purification, the oxygen blood is carried away by what is called the pulmonary veins towards the heart from both the lungs. This circuit is called pulmonary circulation as the lungs are in. Now, 
from the left atrium the blood the purified blood or the awesome blood is pumped into the left ventricle now the systemic circulation starts from the left ventricle now the left ventricle pumps the oxygen in the blood while undergoing contraction into the aorta now this is aorta so which is divides into arterioles then arteries arterioles and minute capillaries and all are supplying blood to different parts of the body just to the abdominal organs and legs and also the topmost part of the body the cranial thoracic organs and arms so the purified blood or oxygen blood from the left ventricle is being pumped through the aorta arteries arterioles and capillaries to each different organs from different organs you have the deoxygen blood is collected by the capillaries a system of venous veins and finally we have what is called this vena cava both we have superior and inferior vena cava here are present only one blood vessel and which enters into the right atrium or which empties the deoxygen blood in the right atrium so the systemic circulation starts with the left ventricle and ends in the right atrium the pulmonary circulation starts from the right ventricle and ends in the left atrium in a zigzag manner so right ventricle left atrium left ventricle right atrium that's why it's called what is known as double circulation as we have two circulations this is one circulation involving the lungs the outer one what it represents is nothing but actually the systemic circulation the whole system it refers to the body organs the whole body so that involves heart and the body pulmonary circulation involves that is the heart and the lungs this is called double circulation you can see in the case of crocodiles all the mammals and all the birds no exceptions are there now i mentioned just the double circulation in humans one is called the pulmonary circulation so the deoxygen blood is pumped by the right ventricle now this is the starting point and enters the pulmonary artery and is normally passed on to the lungs from a once again oxygen blood is carried by the pulmonary veins which open into the left atrium this is called pulmonary circulation as the lungs are involved the second one systemic circulation as the body parts are involved so once again i mentioned the oxygen blood from the left ventricle not from the right ventricle left ventricle and enters the aorta and carried by that aorta along with its branches arterioles capillaries arteries etc to the tissues from where once again the deoxygen blood is collected by a system of venous veins and finally the vena cava superior inferior vena cava which ultimately open into what is called the right atrium once again the cycle has been repeated again so as we have two types of circulation this is called actually double circulation that is very common in the case of crocodiles then birds and mammals and it is actually the systemic circulation what i mentioned it provides oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and taking away carbon dioxide and the harmful waste materials from the cells towards the excretory structures or the place where they are going to be eliminated that's the importance of the systemic circulation now in addition to this one in addition to the pulmonary and then what is called actually the systemic circulation we have some special type of circulatory systems what we call this one the portal system we have a specific system what is called a portal system so what do you mean by a portal system normally suppose if you take one organ organ the impure blood from that organ is taken away by a system of capillaries so this is all the capillaries which are all joined together to form the vein this is a normal vein which empties the blood into the heart this is what we have this is a normal way a normal system normally from each organ the impure blood is collected by a branching network of capillaries these capillaries are all joined together to form a way which normally empties the impure blood into the right atrium of the heart this is normal circulation in some cases the blood is not transported directly to the heart suppose i am taking here one organ maybe a kidney or digestive tract i am taking this is organ number 1 now i am considering this is organ number 2 so from the organ number 2 you see that one the blood is carried away directly by the vein 
But in the case of organ number one, the blood is not carried to the heart directly. There is no direct transport of blood. And here the blood is collected by a branching network of capillaries. So, and these capillaries once again form a blood vessel. And this blood vessel form a second network of capillaries in this heart. So, and this vein normally starts in capillaries in one organ, ending in capillaries in another organ is called as a portal vein. This is portal vein. So see the normal vein. A normal vein starts in capillaries and ends in the heart without capillary formation. But in the case of a portal vein, it starts in capillaries in one organ and ends in capillaries in another organ. And such a vein is called portal vein. And from that organ too, the blood is carried away by the normal vein. So this is called a portal system. A portal system is the one which contains the portal veins, which is stored in capillaries in one organ and end in capillaries in another organ. And from that organ, the blood is transported. So there are two different types of portal systems now in the animal kingdom. What is called a renal portal system? Renal portal system. Another one, hepatic portal system. Now, renal portal system is the one where the kidneys are involved. From the blood, actually, from various parts of the blood, particularly for example, the high limbs, the blood is collected and enters into the kidney. From where the blood is carried away by the renal vein to the what is called the general circulation towards the heart. And in the case of hepatic portal system, blood is collected from various parts of the digestive tract. That is considered as an organ number one. And the blood is emptied into the liver. This is organ number two, liver. That is why it's called hepatic portal system. From where the blood is carried away by the hepatic vein. Now there is one question came in the question paper. Out of these two systems, which system is absent in man? So we have no renal portal system. In the case of birds also we have no renal portal system. In the case of frog and fishes we have the renal portal system. In the case of reptiles actually the renal portal system is not well developed. In the case of birds the renal portal system is poorly developed but in the case of mammals the renal portal system is completely absent. Including human being we have only the hepatic portal system. Here the liver is involved and in this case what is called the kidney is involved. Now let's see. So it is an any type of system, either hepatic portal system or renal portal system. Now it is a unique vascular system, normally exists between what I mentioned earlier, the digestive tract and liver. As the liver is involved, it is called what is known as hepatic portal system. You see that one, from various parts of the digestive system, the blood is collected by means of capillaries. All the capillaries join together to form what is called hepatic portal vein, which once again ends in capillaries in the liver. From the liver, the blood is collected by what is called the hepatic vein. This is what is called the hepatic vein, a normal vein. This is hepatic portal vein. This is what is called hepatic vein, the one which leaves from the liver, carrying the deoxin blade towards the heart or empties the blood into the general circulation. So, and this is what is called the hepatic portal system. See, the hepatic portal vein carries blood from the intestine to the liver from where it is delivered or emptied to the systemic circulation. Now we see actually from various parts of the intestine, the food being transported first directly to the liver, from where water it is transported to the heart, from where water it is being transported to all parts of the body. So don't forget this one. The digestive food materials in the form of glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol all being transported only to the liver directly. From the liver only it is being transported to the heart. So the system or the way which transports the materials from the digestive tract to the liver is called as the hepatic portal way. And if you are considering for example, see the materials like glucose being transported to the liver where it is being stored. So, the amount of glucose that is normally formed in the hepatic vein is much lesser than that of hepatic portal vein. So, in hepatic vein, we are comparing these two veins. The hepatic portal vein contains more glucose when compared to the hepatic.
because it contains an even if you are comparing the amino acids the amount of amino acids formed in the hepatic portal vein is comparatively more when compared to the hepatic vein because in the liver some amount of urea synthesis takes place only by means of the deamination of the amino acids formed so you will come to later about what are the different components which are more in concentration and less in concentration in different types of things so anyway this is what we have don't forget we have only the hepatic portal system there is no renal portal system either in mammals or in human beings so i mentioned about the double circulation that one is uh, what is called the diagrammatic representation now this is actual what you see the heart the red part represents the pure blood and the blue part represents the impure blood now actually this is what we have the pulmonary circulation and this is the pulmonary artery reaching the lungs the two lungs after purification now the purified blood is carried by the pulmonary veins which enter into the blood vessel this is pulmonary circulation then systemic circulation we have now that the pure blood is pumped into the aorta which divides into many branches one is going to the upper part and one is going down to the various parts of the body and from various parts of the body the impure blood is collected and opening into that is what is called the right atrium so that is called as a double circulation that one is diagrammatic representation this is some of actually the various blood vessels and other structures now here has given actually the comparison between the different types of circulation and taking the first ones what is called the fish the red part represent what is called oxygen blood the blue part represents deoxygen blood now in the second case we are taking the amphibians as some reptiles you can see now the blue color represents the impure blood or deoxygen blood the red color represents oxygen blood and this one the gray somewhat violet color represents what is called a mixed blood now in the first case fish you see that one this is the heart which releases only the deoxygen blood and pumps deoxygen blood to the gills or towards the gills where purification occurs from the gills now this circulation from the heart to the gills is called gill circulation and actually from the body parts to the heart is called systemic circulation this is gill circulation and systemic circulation you see in this picture there is no entry of what is called oxygen blood into the heart only the deoxygen blood enters into the heart now in the second case for example the amphibians and some reptiles you see that one there is a mixing of blood see this is deoxygen blood and this is oxygenated as we have only one ventricle when the blood being pumped into a single ventricle there is a chance of mixing of blood and now the heart pumps only the mixed blood it is only the mixed blood which is being transported not only to the various body parts but also to the lungs for purification so here the heart is pumping the mixed blood only to the body parts and also to what is called actually the lungs where purification occurs and after purification the oxygen blood is reaching what is called the left atrium and from the left atrium which enters into the ventricle and mixed with what is called the deoxygen blood so the mixed blood is circulating in various parts of the body so only the circulating blood is nothing but the mixed blood but in the case of higher vertebrates like uh, I have to bring like actually the mammals, the eels, or the birds, and also that is we have the crocodiles. You see, there is no mixing of blood. On the left side you can see the impure blood. So normally this is left side in the picture, but it's the right part of the body, and this is what is called the right part of the picture, but it is only the left part of the body. So we have there is no mixing of blood. That such an efficiency circulation, such an efficient circulation is responsible for the efficient supply of oxygen and nutrients to different parts of the body. So from the heart to the lungs is called pulmonary circulation. Both cases. From the heart, actually from the various body parts to the heart, that represent what is called systemic circulation. Or from the heart to various body parts, that represent what is called actually the systemic circulation. So these pictures represent the comparison between the venous heart. So the heart having mixed blood and the heart which has separate what is called oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. That is why it's called as atrio-venous heart. Now let's pass on to the human circulatory system. As a general rule, in the case of all vertebrates, we have three different components in the circulatory system. One is a muscular heart, the busiest organ in the body, and another one, the pumping organ. 
what is called muscular chambered heart. The second one, a system of network of branch, the tubes, what are called the blood vessels. The third one, the fluid component which is being transported by the blood vessels to different parts of the body. So all of the various metals are transported in a dissolved state. That is why we need a liquid medium being transported through such branching network of tubes called the blood vessels. So there is the fluid blood. So we have a pumping organ in the heart. And number two, we have a network of conveying tubes, what are called the blood vessels. And number three, we have actually the fluid medium for transporting the different materials. So these are all the three different components. As one of time, just I am concluding my part. We will just proceed about the human circulatory system in detail in the next class. Till then, goodbye. And before that, if you have any questions, post your questions and ready to answer. Thank you. Now class is done.